Hi, friends. I'm Pastor Bill Bailey. And I'm Sally. And welcome to Happy Gospel Church here in Bradenton, Florida. We're so glad to have you on today's broadcast. I don't believe it's by accident that we've connected today. I trust that God has something special to say to you, and that's why we're together today. And listen, we'd love for to get connected with you. We're on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. You can subscribe to our YouTube account for all of our service details and other program archives. But let's connect together, and I believe that God is about to speak to you. Thanks so much for watching us here at Happy Gospel Church. We're a non-denominational, spirit-filled church that loves Jesus. Yes, we love amen. people. Let's go in today's service already in progress.
This woman was taken in the very act of adultery. Now listen, I don't know if your mind works like mine does. Probably not, and you ought to thank God for it. But John, I wonder, how did these guys, what were they doing? I mean, they had to be peeping Tom or something. The Bible says she was taken in the very act of adultery. What were they doing? Were they just kind of watching, looking? A little perverted, don't you think? These are God's men. Don't let me go there. And here they brought her in the very act of adultery. They set her in front of Jesus. They don't even speak to her. All of the attention is focused in a religious debate with Jesus and the fact of, of what Jesus would do with her. The scripture says, or the law said, that she was worthy to be stoned. That would have been her punishment. What was Jesus going to do? And the scripture states that twice Jesus writes in the ground, in the sand. Matter of fact, your Bible says he doesn't even look up at those that were accusing her. He just writes in the sand. Now, I don't know what he writes, and the Bible's not explicit, and where the Bible is silent, we should be too. But, but give me just a little literary leeway for a moment. I don't know what Jesus was writing. I've heard preachers preach and say, well, maybe he was writing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. No, he wasn't. But whatever he wrote convicted them, and they all walked away. Whatever he wrote, maybe he was writing their sins. I don't know. They were scholars. They knew about the Old Testament law. Maybe he was writing their life story. I don't know. But what I do know is that one by one, they all walked away. Mama said, be careful when you point your finger at somebody else. Because there's three pointing back at you. And Jesus looks at this woman and says, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they're all gone. And he says, what? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Turn in your Bibles real quickly to Romans, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Are you getting anything out of this? Romans chapter 2, listen to what the Apostle Paul writes here, because I, I, I love, I love this, uh, this scripture. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whomever you are who judges. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge do the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to what? Come on, class, to what? We just talked about that truth. Against them which commit such things. And do you think this, O man, who judges them which do such things and do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Or despise you the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Stop right there. Let me give you the context. Paul is ticked off at people who are judging others who have the same issue in their own lives. And he's saying it's easier for you to see their problem and not your own problem. I don't know about you, but that kind of hits me a little bit. Because it's easier to preach on everybody else's sins and everybody else's shortcomings and everyone else's struggles and not yet deal with my own. And so Paul is basically saying, listen, this is inexcusable. This shouldn't be in the house of God. And in verse 4, he ends it and he says this, not knowing, come on class, that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Everybody say that last line together. The goodness of God leads me to repentance. Personalize it. Say it again. The goodness.
goodness of God leads me to repentance. So let's extricate that line for just a moment because that there is a line put for you and I to understand that what causes people to make a change in their life is the goodness of God. People who will live for God in their life will rarely live for God just because they don't want to go to hell. Now, that's a good reason to get saved, isn't it? It's a good reason to know the Lord, but it shouldn't be the only reason. Because if it's the only reason, I'm going to live a life scared of God. God doesn't want you to be afraid of him. He just wants you to respect him and reverence him. That's what's called the fear of the Lord. But he doesn't want you to live based up your life based upon uh, being afraid of God. Matter of fact, he told us in Hebrews, when we're in trouble, come boldly to the throne room of grace to obtain help in your time of need. I knew my dad loved me and I loved him. So when I got in trouble, I respected him as my father, but I wasn't afraid of him. I came and told dad, listen, I blew it. I messed up. I need some help here in this area. God, uh, and in the same way with God, we can come to him as a child of God boldly and say, God, I blew it. I messed up. I'm in trouble. And here's some good gospel news. He won't turn you away, but rather he'll help you. He's not out to hurt you. He's out to help you. Help you. He's out to bless you. Bear with me, saints that have heard this a zillion times. Daddy loved country music. And his favorite tape, they had eight track tapes in the day. His favorite tape he bought on television from George Jones and Tammy Wynette. And back in those days, every country, you remember this, every country record, no matter how horrible the lyrics were, had a gospel song on it. Every, it didn't matter how horrible the songs were. George and Tammy, they had some of the saddest songs. D-I-V-O-R-C. Don't look so holy on me. You heard it. Becomes final today. That all these uh, just, just sad songs. And here comes the gospel song. George Jones and Tammy Wynette. I can still hear it. Eight years old, sitting in the back seat of the Pontiac Bonneville that my mom and dad had. Daddy put on that eight-track tape, and we'd be riding down the road, and it'd come to the gospel song. Do you know what uplifting, praising the Lord gospel song that George and Tammy sang on their record? God's going to get you for that. God's going to get you for that. There's no place to run and hide for he knows where you're at. God's going to get you for that. God's going to get you for that. Every wrong thing that you've done, God's going to... Yeah. Now listen, I was only eight years old. I didn't know a lot back in those days. But I knew enough about George Jones because mom and daddy always had TNN on television. That was the Nashville Network. That was a country music channel on our cable. And they always had, so I knew enough about George Jones. And here's what I knew just from an eight-year-old boy's perspective. And I don't mean this condescending towards old George at all. But I knew enough about his lifestyle to think this. If God's really going to get you for that, why hasn't he got old George yet? Now listen, from what I understand, he got it right at the end, and that's all that matters. Thank the Lord. But that was the perspective and is the perspective of many Christians. God's just out to get me to hurt me. Or even unbelievers, God doesn't want to help me. God wants to hurt me. Just like a kid steps on roly polies on the concrete. That's the way God is, just looking for me to do something wrong in my life. And what they have done is they've misjudged the character of God. Because even though the truth of God's word says that the wages of sin is death, the truth of God's word also says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Somebody had to make that payment, but it doesn't have to be you or I. Jesus already made the payment complete, paid in full at the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm reminded about old Joel Hemphill, and I told this story a few weeks ago, but Joel told the story talking about this, the truth. 
talking about how that one day when it came, he had done something wrong and his parents believed in, in sparing the rod and spoiling the child. And so he was about to get a whipping. I know today they don't do that much, but in my days they didn't either. They did whoopings back in my day. And Joel told the story where his daddy was about to give him a whooping and he said he, he bent over the knee and you know how you do. You scream, as a kid, we would scream loud. You would think we was about to die right there. That was going to be uh, the hill we died on. Bend over, die. And the reason that you screamed loud was so you hoped that it would lessen how hard he hit you. And so Joel told the story. He's been over screaming and his dad rears back with that belt or that paddle and goes to hit him and says he missed him and actually hit his own leg. That happened once, and the second time he thought, man, i got a reprieve. The second time, Joel's daddy, he goes back up, and he goes to hit him again. And the second time, he missed him and hit his leg again. Joel's thinking, this has got to be God. God is intervening on my behalf. And it happened a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time. And Joel said, when his father released the pressure and he stood up, he said his daddy had big old tears running down his face. And his daddy looked at him and said, Joel, today I took your punishment for you. Just like Jesus took our punishment for us at the cross. The truth of God's word doesn't change. It's what we would call it theologically. Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus took our place. Intercession doesn't mean that we just beg God to do something. Intercession means literally God stood in the gap through his only begotten son, Jesus, to partake of yours and mine's wrath of our punishment, what we deserved. Jesus took it himself. And so today when we talk about the goodness of God, the goodness of God has been extended through his mercy and his grace and his long suffering in our life so that the truth of God's word can be met by what Jesus did at the cross. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Romans says this, not knowing that the goodness of God leads, and I like to make it personal, leads me to repentance. So not because I'm afraid of God, not because I think God's going to hurt me or punish me, but because I know that if I'll repent, if I'll make the change, and that's what repentance means. Repentance means to change your mind or to turn around or to pivot. Repentance isn't something that God does. It's something that we do. I understand that if I do that, if I make that decision, it's for my good. And it's the goodness of God that causes me to make the change. So yes, the starting point, I don't want to go to hell. That's why one of the reasons I accepted Christ as my Savior. But it's not the only reason I accepted Christ as my Savior because I recognized that in order for me to access the best life that I can possibly have, it's going to come through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That my best life cannot be lived apart from a relationship with God. Yes, I want a mansion over the hilltop or a cabin in the corner of glory land or whatever you want to call it. I, I desire that and I'm thankful for that eternal hope that every believer has. But beyond that, I've got to live in this life. I've got to be a husband to my wife, a pastor to my church, a father to my children. Oh, hallelujah. A grandfather to my grandbabies. And the best Life that I can live now cannot be lived apart from the goodness of God extended to my life through his mercy, his grace, 
and his patience. Now, I've lived a long life, at least long enough to hear people say, well, let me tell you, you better get right with God now because if you don't, you, you may not have another opportunity. And there may be some validity or truth to that, but here's what I have found out. God's a whole lot more patient than a lot of Christians are. Because some of you have written people off that God hasn't written off. If you don't know what else to do for that person, pray for them. But don't write them off. Because the hand of the Lord is not short. He is long-suffering, and he is able to save those that are the hardest cases. Don't you give up on the hand of God. Yeah. Psalm 27, verse 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Back to our story. The Bible says that he looks at her and says, where's your accusers? She says, they're all gone. But it's a reminder that none of us, none of us are worthy to accuse someone else. You know, the Bible tells us who the accuser of the brethren is. It's Satan himself. He looks at her and says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now listen, if he, if Jesus would have been, I know we're supposed to be like Jesus, but if Jesus would have been like me or most of my preacher friends, we would have immediately preached and taught her a lesson on adultery. We would have immediately spoke of her past and of her sin. To my knowledge, and again, I will, will be glad to be corrected by my ministerial colleagues, but I don't think I'm wrong. Jesus never referenced her sin. You know, the world we're living in right now is pretty crazy. It seems like things change literally every day. But there's one thing that remains constant, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. God's Word says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So no matter what you're facing today, I want to encourage you that Jesus has an answer. He'll be a help and he'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'd love to pray with you. There's a link at the bottom of the screen. Why don't you send me a note? Let me know how we could pray effectively for you. I'd love to hear from you. And then also, if you're ever in the Bradenton, Florida area, we're about 40 minutes below Tampa Bay, and we'd love to have you join us for one of our in-person services. We have three services currently, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., Wednesdays at 7 p.m., and if you're ever here, We'd love to meet you personally. Likewise, most of our Sunday services are streamed online live, and they're also archived. So you can go to Facebook or YouTube to our platforms, and you can find our services and watch us in person as well online. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I can't wait to see you again at this same time next week. Well, I'm feeling tired. Ah!